Welcome back to a very historic, monumental extravaganza of a spaceflight update because yesterday, an attempt at recovering a booster back to the launch site was made by Blue Origin with their new Shepard's 27 mission. But sadly, they had to abort to troubleshoot a GPS problem with a new launch target forthcoming. We also saw a perfect orbital insertion on Vulcan Centaur's second certification mission to fly national security payloads, despite the nozzle of one of the SRBs falling off 37 seconds into the flight. SpaceX launched the beefy ESA Hera mission on Falcon 9, a mission so ambitious it required expenditure of the first stage booster in similar fashion to today's Europa Clipper launch, which needed the power of an entire expended Falcon Heavy to begin its journey to the Jupiter system. China launched a COM satellite to geosynchronous orbit aboard along March 3, and I guess yesterday was the fifth orbital flight test of Starship or something? <laughs> Okay, I joke, I joke, but at the same time, I know that nobody watching this video hasn't already seen it. Yesterday, SpaceX conducted the fifth fully integrated flight test of the massive Starship vehicle. This was a lot sooner than we were all expecting. The FAA remained steadfast against criticism from members of Congress, Elon Musk, and former President Trump, and even the Coast Guard, who put out a notice to Mariners last Wednesday, indicating a launch as soon as the 12th of October, with a FAA spokesperson bluntly stating that the FAA are not launching authorization for a launch to occur in the next two weeks. It's not happening. Late November is still the target date. However, in addition to mounting political pressure on the FAA, Dutch satellites, a fairly reliable source for inside information, posted on the 2nd of October that they had received a note that two other US agencies had got involved with resolving slash expediting the 60-day consultation mess. And there was a similar post from Ars Technica's Eric Berger, well-known and reliable space reporter, who mentioned hearing chatter that an earlier launch in October could be possible. And everything came to a head on the 11th of October. SpaceX stacked Ship 30 atop Booster 12 and made an intriguing post saying that the vehicle was stacked ahead of its fifth flight test, with regulatory approval expected in time to fly in just two days. Hard and fast launch date estimations are seldom stated by SpaceX without firm belief and internal memos to support, definite regulatory approval and launch. Something further supported by the fact that both the Super Heavy and Starship had been fitted with their flight termination systems, which which are essentially the self-destruct systems of the rocket, and as such, for what are hopefully obvious reasons, these aren't installed until the very last moments. A couple of days later, we had another post from SpaceX, this time not just reaffirming a target launch of Sunday the 13th of October, but also a very precise launch window, opening at 7am central time, again suggesting confidence that they knew with essential certainty that launch license would be granted. And literally later the same day, the license dropped, with specific identifiable reasons for the sudden jump in time frame remaining unclear. Authorizing Space Exploration Technologies Corp, SpaceX's full name by the way for those that didn't know, to launch the Starship Super Heavy Vehicle on SpaceX's intended flight plan, which was basically a repeat of Flight 4, with the ship hopefully staying slightly more intact during re-entry and not landing 6 kilometers off target, and most excitingly, with the Super Heavy first stage returning to the launch pad being caught in the arms of Mechazilla. This decision was made following the success of Flight 4 Super Heavy, which landed at a virtual tower location in the Gulf of Mexico, and a tower catch would only be made if Flight 4 Super Heavy landed with sufficient accuracy. And it was recently announced that the level of accuracy achieved by Booster 11 was to the tune of half a centimeter, which is obviously extremely accurate considering the booster itself is 9 meters wide, although I am curious how SpaceX were able to determine the level of exactitude to such a tiny level of accuracy. Anyway, yesterday of course was when Flight 5 lifted off. It kind of feels a bit moot to cover what happened next because I'm sure you all know by now, but just in case, and because it's cool to rewatch for the 900th time, I will anyway. Prior to liftoff, we first saw methane and oxidizer loading begin on the Starship at T-4950 and 4840 respectively, followed by methane and oxidizer loading beginning on Super Heavy at T-4040 and 3403 respectively, with the entire stack completing propellant load at T-2 minutes and 50 seconds, which funnily enough was the first time the full boot Booster 12 and Ship 30 stack had been fully fueled. Prior tests had only featured partial cryo loading. 
Go for launch came at 30 seconds, the flame deflector activated at 10 seconds, and Super Heavy ignited at 3 seconds, with the monstrous rocket lifting off the pad at T plus 2. It lifted off with more success than Flight 4, in that we saw good sustained ignition of all 33 Raptor engines during ascent. The vehicle effortlessly breezed through Max Q, which is the moment of peak stress on the rocket, with Miko occurring at 2.5 minutes after launch. Miko in this context standing for most engine cutoff, rather than main engine cutoff, as Super Heavy powered down all but three of its engines, while the Starship fired all six of its, hot staging from Booster 12 and continuing to space. Booster 12 then relit all but its outer Raptor engines as it started its boost back burn back to Starbase. At this point, landing wasn't guaranteed. The booster would splash down in the Gulf of Mexico, unless a health check found absolutely no problems with its trajectory or systems, until we finally heard the call out that the landing attempt would actually be made. I remember being extremely tense watching from here on out, partly out of fear the booster would decide it was off nominal and abort itself into the ocean, partly out of fear that it wouldn't be accurate enough and end up destroying a significant chunk of stage zero, and partly because, like, this is all actually happening, for real, like we've been waiting so long. And yeah, we all know what happened next. All those chopstick catch and wait tests paid off, as Soup Heavy made a successful landing burn shutdown, and the chopsticks made a successful catch. And that was that. It's a real testament to the engineers behind Soup Heavy and Mechazilla, not only because, you know, the insanity of this operation actually worked, but also those arms, and by extension the tower itself, are supporting a huge amount of weight there. It's hard to really get a sense of scale at Starbase because there's not really anything nearby to provide scale, but that booster is 70 meters tall, 9 meters wide, and likely weighs about 400 tons on touchdown. Although perhaps even more than that, the frost lines on the side seem to indicate that there's a lot more fuel remaining than I was personally expecting, perhaps because of the fact that the payload was pretty light, after all it was carrying an empty starship with no additional mass from any satellites, or maybe this is just the normal expected level of propellant left. Let me know what you think in the comments below. 70 meters is pretty tall. Last week I actually filmed something that's the same height. I was at Space Cray Today 2024 in Germany, and on my way there, I stopped off at Europa Park and captured some nice off-ride footage of Silver Star, a coaster that's only 3 meters taller than Super Heavy, to give you an idea of how tall Booster 12 actually is. Shout out to everyone at Space Cray Today, by the way. It was great meeting my viewers there, and of course, catching up with other creators like Shadow Zone, Beardy Penguin, Senkrek Starter, and Adrian from NASA Spaceflight. Anyway, the catch of Booster 12 was not where the guaranteed excitement ended. The next phase of the flight was for the ship to not only survive re-entry, but to make a successful controlled splashdown in the ocean west of Australia. This was partially achieved during Flight 4, but with a couple of caveats. Firstly, the flaps, while not completely destroyed, were significantly damaged during re-entry. And secondly, the ship did make a successful splashdown, but was 6 kilometers off target. In preparation for Flight 5, SpaceX completely replaced the heat shield on Ship 30 with the more robust one that covered more of the vulnerable parts of the flap hinges, which worked somewhat, but as you can see, we did still see heating damage to the flaps, albeit not quite to the extent we saw with Ship 29. And then the time came for the landing burn, and it worked! Starship successfully flipped vertical and came to a soft touchdown in the water and apparently it was completely on target this time, something further evidenced by the fact we had a camera in the water capture the vehicle right as it exploded during tip over, either through FTS command or just structural failure during the fall. Either way, SpaceX didn't want to recover Starship and they needed it to sink. The fact that we have this angle here gives me hope that we may see SpaceX release a tracking shot of the ship coming into land just like we saw with Booster 11. Let's keep our fingers crossed that this materialises. Now, in terms of the aftermath of the historic catch of Booster 12, in a somewhat unexpected move, SpaceX have reinstalled it back onto the launch mount, which is pretty wild. It left the launch mount under its own power and then returned straight back with no transfers required, if you don't count the chopsticks lowering, I guess. I'm still kind of speechless about the whole thing, to be honest. <laughs> now that we've had the chance to take a good look at it again, it's apparent that one of the chines has sustained some damage, possibly secondary to a rupture of one or more of the onboard COPD tanks used to restart the central engines. Looking back at the landing footage again, it looks like there was a bit of a fire in this spot, so perhaps SpaceX will add more heat shielding to this part of the rocket for future missions.
Moving on, as mentioned, I was at Space Creator Day last week, and last Monday I was travelling to Germany, so I couldn't make an episode of Space this week. The space industry was apparently made aware of this fact though, and so thoughtfully, all countries suspended orbital launch activity for the entire week, aside from one launch selfishly not postponed by United Launch Alliance. So I guess I have time to talk about all the orbital launch attempts from the past fortnight. Last week saw plenty of activity. While we had a rare week of no Starlink launches, Falcon 9 did see action launching the European Space Agency Hera mission on Monday, an ambitious mission that set out to study the Didymos binary asteroid system. If the name sounds familiar, then that's because the very same asteroid was impacted by NASA's DART spacecraft two years ago. Hera will investigate the size and shape of the crater four years after the initial impact, as well as fully assess the physical properties and the composition of the Didymos system both on a surface level and the asteroid subsurfaces and internals. It'll do this both with the Hera orbiter itself and two smaller probesats called Juventus and Milani, which will get even close to the surface of the asteroid and make a landing attempt. This mission is certainly an ambitious one. In fact, it was so ambitious that a regular reusable Falcon 9 wouldn't have been enough. And so SpaceX dropped the first stage with no fuel remaining for a landing attempt, leaving this booster to crash and be destroyed in the ocean. After completing this, its 23rd mission, which is always kind of sad to see, especially because I really wanted to see if we'll get a booster hit 25 missions total. This particular Falcon 9 booster was tied with B-1062 for the oldest Falcon 9 booster, and B-1062 was also recently destroyed after tipping over on the shortfall of Gravitas drone ship during the Starlink 8-6 launch. There were two other launches last week. Thursday saw China launch a Long March 3BE to geosynchronous Earth orbit, carrying a single payload, the WHG-03, from the Zishang Satellite Launch Center. Not much is known about the secretive satellite itself, other than the fact it's a communication satellite. No pictures or any information about its customers or clients have been shared, which is usually an indication that the satellite is intended for military applications. United Launch Alliance's premier launch vehicle, the Vulcan Centaur, so far has only one flight to its name. At least until the 4th of October, that is. This was Mission Certification 2, the second of the two launches required by the United States Space Force for a rocket to fly national security space launch payloads. It was originally supposed to carry Sierra Space's first Dream Chaser mission, but due to scheduling delays, the rocket launched with a mass simulator on board instead, as well as some experiments and demonstrations of future Centaur 5 technology. The mission began nominally, but after approximately 37 seconds, something was clearly wrong. Look at the asymmetrical plumes coming from the side-mounted solid rocket motors. This is being caused by the fact that the nozzle fell off one of them, creating not just asymmetrical plumes and asymmetrical thrust, but it also left a shower of debris in the exhaust. The flight wasn't terminated though. Instead, the solid rocket boosters continued for the entirety of their planned 90 second burn. Despite this setback, which caused the rocket to tilt slightly off course before the onboard avionics could correct, the rocket achieved perfect orbital insertion, which is a real testament to Blue Origin's work with those two BE-4 engines powering the core, which were able to provide sufficient vector control to keep the rocket on course, and the engines extended their burn by approximately 20 seconds to compensate for the SRB anomaly. This will have provided great data to not just ULA, but also to Blue Origin, who I'm sure are relieved they didn't have to acquire such data from an anomaly from one of their own launches such as the New Shepard 27 mission. This was planned to launch yesterday, same day as Starship Flight 5, but unfortunately had to be delayed to troubleshoot a GPS issue. That or this was simply a cover because the teams were too busy watching the Starship stream. <laughs> this is a very exciting mission to look forward to though. It's a certification flight that will see the debut of not just a brand new human rated New Shepard crew capsule, the RSS Carmen line, but also a brand new New Shepard booster, NS5. Since it's a certification mission, it's not going to carry any humans to space, but it will be carrying 12 payloads that include two LiDAR sensors for Blue Origin's Lunar Permanence program and a replica of the monolith from 2001 A Space Odyssey. Another launch that didn't happen last week, but did happen today, was the launch of Europa Clipper, which launched aboard a Falcon Heavy a few hours ago now. I've said before, many times on Space This Week, that Europa Clipper is my most anticipated mission of the decade, easily, as it'll be searching the subsurface oceans of Europa, moon of Jupiter, for signs of life, 
as it's one of the places most likely to harbour conditions compatible with supporting alien life in our solar system. The moon is estimated to have twice the volume of water of Earth, something that will hopefully be confirmed by this mission, as well as the composition of Europa's surface and any evidence of geological activity. The spacecraft gets its name for the fact that rather than simply orbiting Europa, it will clip past the moon on 44 close flybys from a highly elliptical Jupiter orbit in order to avoid overexposure to the intensely radioactive environment that is Europa's location, thanks to Jupiter's magnetosphere. Although it's extremely exciting that it's finally launched, it's going to be a while before we get data on Europa itself. It'll take until the end of the decade for the spacecraft to reach its destination. But I can wait. <laughs> In similar fashion to last week's Falcon 9 mission, no booster recovery was made for any of the three Falcon Heavy cores. All three were expended for this mission. But yeah, that's it. I'll leave you with a massive thanks for watching and a huge thank you to all the names on the right hand side of your screen. They're my supporters on Patreon and my YouTube channel member program, and they really do make all of this possible. Otherwise, I really hope you enjoyed today's episode of Space This Week. Tune in on Saturday for my next Kerbal Space Program mission, where I'll be taking a look at the origins of modern rocketry with the help of a few mods. I, I really like how the video came out. It's both informative, but also I, I think rather entertaining. Uh, that's it, sorry I sounded ill for this video, but I've got to